Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the study um, on the line simply presented. This may be the last study. I think I should be able to sum everything up. Uh, but before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we're thankful for your presence throughout the day and um, in the time that we have to study together. We invite your Holy Spirit to teach us and to give us a clear understanding of these lines, that we can share them with others and that they can uh, impact our own lives. We pray for each per person watching these videos. We pray that they can be encouraged and by the things that we are studying. And um, we ask that uh, this study today that you can guide and help us <coughs> as we seek uh, to have a clear understanding. Help me to sum these things up, to bring them into sharp focus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So when we started, uh, hi everyone, uh, when we started, sorry about that, uh, to look at these lines, we looked at Isaiah 28. And the whole idea of line upon line is an extension of Miller's rules. It comes from the Bible itself. And uh, we have generally understood as Adventists that line upon line meant verse upon verse. And it doesn't mean that that's not applicable. But when we look at it more specifically, more detailed, we know that line upon line is uh, a precept, which is to set in order. A line is a line of measurement or judgment. Um, and uh, um, we are to mark events from here to there, from here to here. So we're setting in order these, these way marks. And that's what we have been doing. We use Millerite history as our main uh, template in which to compare all other histories. And um, in doing this, in setting things upon a line, uh, we notice things that we would not possibly have noticed by just reading through the Bible. I mean, we see the chronological connection, connections, the spans of time. Um, now, when these lines were first uh, addressed by this movement, I mean, we have a very basic understanding of these lines. As uh, the seven thunders were unsealed and we came to understand Millerite history much more clearly, um, we and we had understood that we're repeating Millerite history, um, we started to see that there was more to the lines than we had thought. And that is one of the things we see is that Every waymark typifies every other waymark for the very simple reason that a waymark in itself is a line. That is, we can zoom into a waymark and, and we can see uh, a whole line. And so we saw that in, in our studies examining the lines um, or understanding the lines uh, that we've been doing for over a year now that um, we could clearly see that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is a line. Joseph, Joseph is the fourth angel. But each of them have their own lines. And we saw this in Millerite history. Millerite has a, Miller has a line. Um, we could zoom into any of the way marks, and we can see a line. Now, we've seen this much more clearly in the book of Judges, which we're not studying here. But in the book of Judges, uh, we could see that... Um, uh, especially in studying the book of Judges, we saw that 9-11 and 11-9, that is November 9th, 2019, are tied together. And um, so when we saw the second angel arrive as 9-11, it was, it was actually um, connected to 11-9. We just didn't notice it at the time. Now, I'm not going to go through all these lines again, but I am going to look at some things in Isaiah 28. So we're going to read about this line online, and we're going to notice some things uh, that we haven't noticed um, and pay attention to some details that are much more significant now to us than they would have been um, a year ago. Now, we know at first Isaiah 28 starts with the drunkards of Ephraim. And um, one of the things we can do with this 
is we're going to see that uh, this chapter isn't just talking about line, and line, line upon line. It illustrates line upon line. So, so we, we'll see this as we go through it. So the first thing, woe to the crown of pride, to the drunkards of Ephraim, whose glorious beauty is a fading flower, which are on the head of the fat valleys of them that over, are overcome with wine. Behold, the Lord hath a mighty and a strong one, which has a tempest of hail and a destroying storm as a flood of mighty waters overflowing shall cast down to the earth with the hand. So when it talks about this flood of mighty waters, this overflowing, we see this later in Isaiah 28. This would be the Sunday law. We would understand that this is talking about the Sunday law that's going to be coming. Um. And the glorious beauty, which is on the head of the fat valley, shall be the fading flower. And as hasty fruit before the summer, which when he that looketh upon it seeth, while it is yet in his hand, he eateth it up. In that day shall the Lord of hosts be for a crown of glory and for a diadem of beauty unto the remnant of his people. So that word that's translated residue is just remnant, right? It's just another word for remnant, and for a spirit of judgment and to him that sitteth in judgment and for strength to them that turn the battle to the gate. Now, we haven't done this in this study, but when we talk about the battle at the gate, where does that apply in our history? In the book of Judges, we've address that you turn the battle to the gates where is the battle at the gate or to the gate here that's arm enders uh that um uh, mm. that was on i'm sorry yeah that was on arm ender right um, but it, lead, it leads us to november 9th 2000 right so november 9th right now we can also see that this does apply to 9 11. Right. Okay. So because when it talks about the drunkards of Ephraim here in this context, um, I mean, this the Ephraim can refer to northern Israel, so it could refer to the Protestants. So there's different applications we can make of it, but we can apply it to 9-11. So we can see that uh, the Adventist church here in this context at 9-11 would be represented by the drunkards of Ephraim. And we, we've come to understand that 9-11 is the Sunday law. So, um, and, and we're going to illustrate this, but because <clears throat> we've done it many times. I'm just gonna grab this well, it's also a 9-11. I mean, it, it's got all the numbers in it. Right, yeah. So... Um, So we're, we're, we're going to draw this out, and we're going to come back to this text. Didn't, didn't we call it a reflect, reflection of 9-11, 11-9? Okay, a reflection? Yeah, you know. 911 when you're looking at it sort of in a mirror or or when you flip it this yes. uh yeah not looking at a mirror but when you flip it that's right it didn't mm -hmm. it wasn't a mirror it was a flipped image yeah yeah there's different ways you could explain it so uh, what we want to have here is this line about that okay so we we know that we have you know 1844 10th day of the seventh month right that's going to be the third angel arrives 
and we have its formalization in 1888. And we have its empowerment at the Sunday Law, right? So you over here, Sunday Law, that's the third angel empowered, right? That's from Ellen White's perspective. Okay, and then we know right. we know that this Sunday law history has Ellen White says there's a repeat of the first and second angels message. So we would understand these as being uh, 1989, 9/11, and we came to at first before we had 9/11, we had the Sunday law, the loud cry, the close of probation. As time went on. This line came to zoom in here so that we had a line here from 9-11 to the Sunday law. And then we had these waymarks, midnight and the midnight cry. And we just put them in this line, even though we have the loud cry over here and Ellen White uh, parallels the loud cry with the midnight cry. So and the Sunday law with the close of probation for the Adventists. So we can see that this midnight and this loud midnight cry and loud cry are connected. But this is a type. So when we did this, um, one of the things that we had is we had a formalization and empowerment. And that empowerment was also 9-11, right? So 9-11 paralleled August 11th. 1840, right? So that's what happened there. And this is the arrival of the second angel. And then we broke this line out in this way. So you got 9-11, that's the first day in the first month. And then you have midnight, and that's the fifth day of the fourth month. And then you have the midnight cry, that's the first day of the fifth month. And then you have the Sunday law, that's the 10th day of the seventh month. This is the lines as they were understood in 2016 and 2017. And um, of course, this is gonna be April 19th, July 21st, August 15th and October 22. All right, and these all became symbols. Um, and of course, if you add 11 plus 54, 4 plus 15 plus 107, you get 187, which is the number of days from the first day of the first month to the 10th day of the seventh month in an inclusive count. Um, <clears throat> so when we start to look at our line, though, we know that this Sunday law is still future. Midnight cry is still future, and midnight is still future. That's what we've come to understand. Now, the reason why we kept getting way marks that were midnight and the midnight cry in our history is because we were zoomed in to 9-11 as being the arrival of the second angel. So when we uh, looked at this line as 9-11 as the second angel arriving, we could see that 9-11 and November 9th are tied together when we zoom in. So we have another line. And so the line that we um, are zoomed into is 9-11, but it begins or, or is connected to 11-9, November 9th. So what we're, what we're doing then when we're looking at Isaiah 28 we're looking at these dates. We have November 9th. Oops. November 9th. Well, I'll just put it as 11 9. It's easier. So we go 11 9, 2019. And so there's a period of darkness prior to this. And this is the drunkards of Ephraim. And do they know how to study the Bible? 
No. No, they don't have Miller's rules. Right. All they have is vomit, right? Because they're drinking, they're drunk with the wine of Babylon, with the teachings of the Protestants. And that's the outcome, is vomit. Yeah, so what we have is vomit, right? The tables, say the two tables, are full of vomit. and vomit on the two tables. And so when we talk about turning the battle to the gates, this is something that really specifically this movement is now doing um, since November 9th. Now, we can also you know, see that this is 9-11, right? But when we zoom into this, it becomes 11-9. So this is this movement at the present time. Parminder comes into this conflict uh, with this movement. And so we have all of this light that's being given to us since November 9th. And how we get that light is line upon line. So line upon line existed before, but it, it applies much more specifically in the details in which we have uh, gleaned from it after, especially after July 18, 2020. So, so we have a line. So we have a period of darkness. We have an increase of light that's going to come when this message arrives. So this is going to be the arrival of the first message. So you got uh, the first angel arrives on November 9th. But remember, we can tie this to 9-11. So they're not, they're not really separate. Um, it's just that they come to a head here, right? So 9-11 and 11-9 are really the same way, Mark. When Jeff was pointing to 9-11 as the second angel arriving, he was really describing 11-9. Now we're putting it has the first angel arriving that's because we're zoomed into this way mark and creating this new line so we're going to have all of these way marks the first angel is formalized the first angel is empowered then we have a second angel arrives and we have a second angel i don't want to keep drawing up there second angel formalized um second angel empowered and then we get a third angel arriving so so this is happening in our history right now but this, this is a zoom into when we talk about this this isn't necessarily the what's sun. the darkness the darkness is the drunkards of ephraim it's the okay but uh, I, I you know what uh, we would communicate it earlier today yeah Chronologically, it would have been eight eleven that they missed eighteen forty because that's what that's what they didn't accept. They forgot about the August eleventh eighteen forty prediction, which brought a wonderful impetus into the movement, and it's connected with the it's connected with nine eleven in a sense. Okay, uh, you cut out briefly there i'm sorry what did you miss what happened here? Uh, that was my mistake just hang on so okay say what you're saying again i ended up turning off so um why were they drunkards of ephraim because what was the darkness the darkness was that they had forgotten about august 11th 1840 yeah, to make the connection with the second angel's message. Right. So, so they chronologically, they missed 8 11, 1840. Right. Now we know um, when we look at uh, November 9th, let me see here. That November 9th, 2019, the biblical date is 8-11, right? It's the 11th day of the uh, eighth month. 
both on the biblical and the rabbinic calendar. Okay, so I so find that see. interesting as well to go along with that one through eleven. Mm -hmm. So, so we can see that what what they're missing out is August eleventh, eighteen forty, the empowerment right. of the the first angel's message in Millerite history, which right. is nine eleven, and so that's being rejected by Parminder's group, but in a very subtle way. So Parminder tries to say that he's a defender of 9-11, but actually he, re he rejects 9-11. So, so the rejection of 9-11 not only did was rejected by the, the uh, organized church, it was also uh, uh, rejected by the, uh, what do they call themselves, the Alpha or the Omega? Well, they, they call themselves something else. They're the Omega, but but they call themselves something else now. Right, but so they were the Omega, um, but that was another a repeat of history in a sense, um, because right. Adventism repeated. I mean, it was repeated from Adventist mistakes of nine eleven was also now transposed into the eleven nine. Right. So um, when we when we zoom into nine eleven as the arrival of the second angel. What we're actually doing is we're zooming into the Sunday law, but it, it becomes much more personal to this movement. So what happened with the church at 9-11 happens with this movement at 11-9. Can we put this into that aspect of a triple application of prophecy? Um, well, like we could, but I mean, it's just z simply zooming into a waymark. I get it. I get yeah. it. I, I don't know if you need the triple application of prophecy to do that. But yeah, when we zoom into a waymark, we can now look at this line upon line method as it's applying to the movement at the present time. That's what I'm looking at Isaiah 28 for. Because we want to see that this is about this battle at the gate. And that gate is the institutions or the of the movement that uh, Parminder tries to take over. Now, he doesn't get them, right? But those institutions then cease. There's no more School of the Prophets, no more Lambert Church, and no more FFA. And, and so we saw that in the Book of Judges. So somebody watching this may want to watch. With all those symbols that were applied to that sale. Yeah, <clears throat> right. So, so this is the context in which um, we, we're, we're looking at this line. So we're looking at this as a, as a line, right? They stumble in judgment. They err in vision, right? They've erred through strong drink. I'm kind of reading the verse backwards. For all the tables are full of vomit and filthiness so that there is no place clean. And then, then there's this question. Now, uh, it says, whom shall he teach? Whom shall he teach knowledge? Now, notice 1844. So this is one of the things that we have done is we've looked at the Hebrew numbers. And we see 1844 there for the word knowledge. Right. So it's not a common word that you see for knowledge. It's de dea. Right. Um. Okay, and which so is just one more of those little, little things. Yep. Now, um, there's another thing here too, which is Let's see if I can find this. Um, so we have this number eight five three. Uh, now it's in brackets. Now this is pretty obscure, but does anybody know what eight five three represents? I don't expect anybody to know, but that's the year of the Hijra, <coughs> where we start the three hundred ninety-one years. 
and 15 days. That's July 27th, 1440. Is this, is this uh, solar, Muslim? Um, what calendar? Islamic. Hijra. That's the Islamic calendar. Islamic calendar. Okay. So it's year um, 853 of the Islamic calendar. That's July 27th, 1449. Because the Islamic car calendar starts in 1622 and they have uh, shorter years than we have. Right. So um, that's going to be the 27th day of the fifth month in 853 of the year of uh, the Hijra. Right. So. So anyway, that that is a um, a date which on the mind calendar, the last three digits are 871. And it's 1111, 871 is the Mayan date. So, so there's a lot of symbolism in there, but it's just that 853, and, and it's in brackets because it's untranslated word. That's why it's in brackets. It's this word, um, et, and it's interesting word because it means a sign of the definite direct object, not translated in English, but generally preceding the indicated and indicating the accusative. Um, so, so the fact that it's there, I think, is kind of interesting. But these are things that we look at, 853, 1844, right? So these are symbols, even in just the Strong's numbers. Um, so the answer to this is for precept upon, must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, and there a little. For with the stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people to whom he said, this is the rest wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. So we can see that this is about the Holy Spirit be, get, being given. And yet they're not listening, right? And so this would apply to November 9th, 2019. But we're, what we're given here is this arrival of this first message is a message regarding line upon line that's different than what we had before. Now it says, but the word of the Lord was unto them, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, and there a little, that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. Now, what this means simply is that even though they didn't hear, um, they are still going to be part of this line, but it's going to show their destruction. Right, so that makes sense. If if you don't accept precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little, you're still going to experience it. Because it's a prophecy about what's going to happen. And if you don't accept it, you get the reward there, right? The right fall backward, broken, snared, and, and taken. Take yeah. And um, so then we have this next part of this message. So we're going to say that that's the arrival of the first message. It's this message of line upon line. Wherefore, hear the word of the Lord, ye scornful men that rule this people, which is in Jer Jerusalem. Um, so this scornful, this is mockery. That's what they mean, these mocking men. Because you have said we have made a covenant with death and with hell we are at agreement. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, it shall not come unto us, for we have made lies our refuge and falsehood. And under falsehood have we hid ourselves. Now, when is this? Because we're dealing with a line that Isaiah 28 is addressing. 
Sunday law? Well, it, he, it's going to talk about the Sunday law that you're the now overflowing scourge. That's how I associated it with. When do they make the covenant with death is the question. So since they made a covenant with death, the Sunday law, they will not be able to to stand. Right. So 9-11. Well, this isn't. So remember, this line started with 11-9. We say the angel, the first angel arrived at 11-9. And now we well, have when they rejected the 9 11, that's when they made the covenant, right? Or, well, actually, it started way before that, but this okay, was but their, who, one of their this final is, things. Okay, but this is Parminder's movement that, that, that we okay, were talking yeah, about sorry. before. And so now they're separated out at the first end, angel's message. So we had a message that came at 11 9. Now that message related to. Uh, the Levitical chiasm. I know a lot of this stuff we haven't actually dealt with in these studies, but I want to show you that when we look at this line, we can place it that when they made a covenant with death and when they were in agreement with hell, right? Now they believe because they made this covenant with death and this agreement with hell, that the whole, the overflowing scourge shall not come unto them, Right. Right. So who, who did this after Parminder's group? And how could we, we illustrate this? Um, FFA at 187. Well, at December 6th, actually. December 6th, right? So their right. De declaration, is that not a rejection of... That's a formalized rejection, yes. Yeah. So, so what we would do is we would put this on this line as December 6, 2020. That's a formalization. Now, of course, that's a rejection of a message. And we say, well, why is it a formalization? They wrote it down on paper. Yeah. But there is also the opposition to what they did. Right. So they do this. But it, our response to this declaration is the formalization of the message that arrived at 11.9. Now, what they rejected there specifically was the explanation for the disappointment. Yeah, that's that, that seems right. Okay. So, I mean, we could put July 18th in there and we can say because what was explained at July 18th was uh, what was presented uh, on November 9th, 2019. So on November 9th, 2019, I'm at the School of the Prophets. I present two studies on the 273. But within those studies on the 273 is the study on the 11,900 days and 1,190 hours. Right? That's... 391 months, right? If you take 391 months, times 29.530587, can't remember. I can't remember if I use 587 or 594. Use one or the other. Um, no, and I don't use 391 months that way. I use 403 uh, um, because there's actually 403 lunar months in 391 years. So 391 months on our calendar are 403 months on the lunar calendar. So I, I don't know if I want to go in and explain that. But the point is I take 403 times 29.530587. And I get, um, if I do my math correctly, I get uh, 111,000, 11,900.826561 days. And I'll show you this here for people to see this. 
So this is just 403 lunar months, which is equal to 391 Gregorian months. It's 33 years and seven months on the Islamic calendar and 32 years and seven months on uh, the Gregorian calendar. So 327, we get a 273 in there if we mix those digits around. So this extra part is part of a day, right? But how much a part of a day is it? We subtract 11.9, 100 from it, and we multiply this by 24. We get 19 hours, right? That's what that is. And then we subtract 19, and we multiply it by 60 minutes, and we get uh, 19 hours and 50 minutes, right? So we could look at it that way, or we can go back to it this way and simply go times 60, and we'll get how many minutes it is. Whoops, I didn't do that right. I got to get this number. So 19 hours, I got to get back to this number. Here's the number I want. So if we multiply this number times not 60 minutes, but 1,440 minutes, because that's how many minutes in a day, it's going to give us 1,190 minutes. And, you know, 10 or 12 seconds or whatever that is, 14 seconds. Okay, does that make sense to people? So that means that period of time is 11,900 days and 1,190 minutes. So we're going to keep that in mind. <clears throat> so we're going to draw these things on a line, but I want to go through these verses first. So we're saying that that's what they rejected on December 6, 2020, officially. So either that's the formalization or the empowerment. We have to decide which because uh, I haven't drawn out this line yet. But it says, therefore, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. So what happens after the formalization of a message? Um, the, next, the next thing to happen is uh, another, the next angel. Well, no, the, the, what we have is, is the laying of the foundation. So we have the formalization of the message, and then the foundation is laid. That's how we've always done these lines. So, yeah, the next way mark is going to be the empowerment of the message. But we can see that once you have a formalization of the message, a foundation is laid. Now, this movement... Right is going to um, respond to this December 6th, 2020 declaration, right? So we're gonna, we're gonna respond to it, uh, but we're gonna have a bunch of things happening. We're gonna have the bombing of Nashville on December 25th. We're gonna have the siege of Washington on January 6th. Um, and then on March 7th, we're gonna start examining the foundation. Right, we're going to start a series on called Examining the Foundation. And, and so it's in this period, this period after the rejection of the explanation for July 18, 2020. And if we look at July 18, 2020, I mean, it, it's lots of different things in different waymarks. But in this waymark, if we understand what the um, um, what the darkness is and how what this message is that responds to this darkness. It is the message that has come to this movement since November 9th. And, and we see that because prior to November 9th, we did have symbolic dates and so forth. But we start to apply things and we could say we started doing that after September 7th, but Specifically after November 9th, we're introduced with um, the Mayan calendar. We're introduced with a, a, a stronger emphasis on July 18th. So we start before November 9th. But we can just put that together. 
Um, and we start to um, lay a foundation, right? So, so, you know, exactly where we want to say which one's the formalization, whether we put July 18th as the formalization, December 6th as the empowerment. Um, and there's, you could even talk about that, there being the work of the enemies in there. So, so we would have to figure that out. So we haven't drawn out this line yet, but I'm just showing you the elements of a line. But we can see there's a lane of the foundation and that's part of the line. Now it says, uh, after he says this, he says, judgment also will I lay to the line and righteousness to the plummet and hail shall sweep the refuge of lies and the water shall overflow the hiding place. Now we see a symbol there, Isaiah 28, verse 17. What is the symbol there? Seven one eight two. What is seven one eight two? If we read the verse backwards, July eighteenth, twenty twenty. Right. So you have July eighteenth, twenty twenty, symbolized there in that verse. Now we can see that the language here is the language of the Sunday law. But it's, it's not saying that this is the Sunday law. It's talking about a preparation for the Sunday law. Judgment also will I lay to the lie, right? So we know that judgment, as we're going to see, is a waymark. And so he's going to place a waymark on the line. Right, now the line is a line of judgment. So judgment will he lay to the line and righteousness to the plummet. So the plummet is the way mark itself. But he's going to lay to this line a way mark, which is called righteousness. Now that Hebrew number 6666 is, is an interesting number. It's the number of days between Dwight and Iran's births. It's also 6 times 6 times 6. Times six is the number of days between me and Dwight's birth. Okay. And then we have this word plummet, 49 to 49. So it's a doubling of 49. What is 49? Seven times seven. Seven times seven. And do we connect 666 with 777? Is that the symbol of the great controversy of the Sunday law? Yep. Right. It's the Sabbath is the seventh day. Now we have it doubled twice, seven times seven and seven times seven, 49, 49. That's the plummet. And righteousness is this number that relates to the Sunday law, 666. Okay. So we, we surely can see these symbols in this verse. Now, July 18th is not the Sunday law, but it relates to the Sunday law. Right, because July 18th is the 187th, uh, or December, uh, the 10th day of the seventh month is the 187th day of the year. And we have December 25th, 2021, uh, symbolizing that, the Sunday law. So we can see how this relates to the line, that when you talk about July 18th, you're talking about something that typifies the Sunday law. So within our movement, we can see that July 18th was typifying the Sunday law on one level. That is Samuel Snow's letters. It related to Samuel Snow's letters. So July 18, 2020 relates to July 18, 1844. Samuel Snow's last letter published prior to midnight. And your covenant with death shall be disannulled and your agreement with hell shall not stand when the overflowing scourge shall pass through. Then ye shall be trodden down by it. 
So those that reject July 18th, that reject line upon line, that reject the symbols that connect, that gave us July 18th, they're not going to be able to pass the Sunday law. And from the time that it goeth forth, it shall take you for morning by morning shall it pass over and by day and by night. Right. So night there, 391.5. Well, it's 391.5. And shall be a vexation only to understand the report. So what do they mean? That it'll be a vexation only to understand the report. What does that mean? They're going to be frightened. So when the Sunday law comes, they're going to be frightened, right? For the and and then one of my favorite verses: for the bed is shorter than a man and can stretch himself on it, and the covering narrower than that he can wrap himself in it. I, I like that verse because it remember it reminds me of uh, a situation I was in uh, when I was hitchhiking, and I had to sleep on the ground with a stone for a pillow. And I had just this little short blanket that obviously I couldn't fit in. And uh, thankfully, I had my dog to keep me warm. But uh, um, I always love that imagery there. But we see here that there is some symbolism. And what is the symbolism in this verse? Why, why is this example given? The bed is shorter than a man can stretch himself. Any, any ideas about this? Would that have anything to do with time? Um, uh, thinking they have more time? Yes. So so we would look at this as time. Um, now, the word here, a stretch himself, is prolong, to prolong. Um, wait, that's what the word means. Now, it's not the same word that's talked about um, in other places, uh, but let me see if we can find, there are some places this relates to. Um, it's more in, now it's translated as a super superfluous, right? So what does it mean something that's superfluous? not really necessary or you know yeah it's it's unnecessary or insufficient sometimes okay but if we look at this as a line right because this is about line upon line we would be in a sense short-sighted now See, I relate this to what's happening in the movement at the present time. So maybe this is just uh, subjective on my part. But I really think that the predictions that are being made fit into this verse. Isaiah 20, 8, 20? Yeah, 28, 20. People see what I'm saying here. Maybe people who are watching the video can make some notes, but I do. I understand what you're saying. Okay. Because this is incomplete. It's not taking everything into consideration. We've, you know, we could use other illustrations. You can paint yourself into a corner. You basically can start down a wrong path and be unwilling to turn back. 
you know, lots of things, lots of other illustrations could be used. Um, but that's the way I look at this, this verse. It's, you've made this agreement, but it's not going to be sufficient. You're going to be pretty uncomfortable at some point. For the Lord shall rise up as in Mount Perizim, he shall be wroth as in the valley of Gibeon, that he may do his work, his strange work, and bring to pass his act, his strange act. Now we know this is talking about the destruction of the wicked at the end of the world, but we're applying this to our time now, right? And so verse 22, now therefore be ye not mockers, lest your bands be made strong, for I've heard from the Lord God of hosts a consumption even determined upon the whole earth. So um, so these here uh, bans is like a restraint that you're, you're going to be uh, tied up. So we can't be mockers. We can't be scoffing. Right? Because when we do that, what are we going to be doing to ourselves? Well, you're becoming an accuser or, you know, um, rejecter of, of thing or potential rejecter of God's word because you never know who the real instrument is at that particular moment. It's just... He's delivered it. Now you have to make make the, uh, the, uh, the not the guess, but the educated evaluation as to whether it's truth or not. Right. And and we're going to, if we make our bed, we're going to have to sleep in it. And there you have it. Yeah. So give ye ear and hear my voice, hearken and hear my spirit, speech. And this is the part that I think is quite interesting that we just generally don't address. Doth the plowman plow all day to sow? What's the answer to that question? Well, yeah. I mean, he plows all day so he can sow. Yeah, but he doesn't sow. He, he doesn't just plow. Right? He's going to have to sow. Right. And so... Uh, it's this is kind of not the best translation here. It's a little bit obscure. Um, uh, let me see if I can find um, this one. Says, does he who plows for sowing plow continually? Does he continually open and harrow his ground? So it says, when he has leveled its surface, does he not scatter dill, sow cumin? And put in wheat in put in wheat in rows and barley in its proper place, and emmer as the border. So the idea here of this verse is that you can't just plow; you need to plant. Now, line upon line is plant is plowing, right? Yes. This is a, this is an illustration that Parminder used and misused. So we need to plow, but we need to mark these, we need to plant the things in their proper place. In their rows. In their rows and, um, and the appointed barley and the rye in their place, right? Things have to be planted correctly. You don't just plow, you have to plant. And if we look at these plowings as lines, we have to place the way marks specifically. How, is that not what we've been doing in our morning studies for over a year? Yeah, well over a year. Yeah. So we've been going line upon line, understanding line upon line, and we've been planting in the rows that have been plowed. Says, for his God doth instruct him 
to discretion and doth teach him. Right. So that, mean, that means we have to be taught of God in order to understand line upon line to apply it correctly. Uh, for the fitches are not threshed with a threshing instrument. Um, so that's a fennel flower fitches. Uh, neither a cartwheel is turned about upon the, the cumin. Um, and uh, but the fitches are beaten up with a staff and the cumin with a rod. So why rod and staff? Why, why are these mentioned here? Um, aren't they have something to do with judgment? Well, God's rod and his staff will comfort me. Thy rod and thy staff will comfort me. But here we're seeing that you, you plant the seeds, you put them in their proper places, and then they're going to bear fruit, right? They're going to be, there's going to be a harvest. But in beating, in, in that harvest, you have to treat each of the, the, the fruits of that harvest correctly. Right. 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 Now, of course, a rod and a staff that, you know, in some ways we can think of them, we can translate these words as the same a word in English. Um, so they have staff as a branch, as extending figuratively a tribe, also a rod, whether for chastising, ruling, throwing, or walking staff. For example, um, a support of life. Rod staff tribe. So staff there can refer to a, a tribe even. Uh, now rod 7626, um, that's also a branch, um, a stick for punishing, writing, fighting, ruling, walking, or figuratively a clan. So we could say a tribe and a clan, but they're very similar. So we have these two different it's saying that we may need to make a distinction, and they give us two Hebrew words that are actually very similar. But it, but it could be that there's this, we also have this cart uh, and the wheel, neither is a cart wheel turned about upon the cumin, right? So we use a threshing instrument. We don't just run over our crops. I think that's probably the main point here. Bread corn. Bread what, corn wait wait a second. <laughs> the, the wheel, we don't use the wheel to um, flesh out the, the grain, right? Yeah. So we don't use the wheel to flesh out grains. So are you are you hearing yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, I think so. The wheels being the wheels within wheels, which is what all these things that we're we're coming up with. Um, okay. Um, and we're not we can't use these things to flesh out the wheat or the grain. Yeah, so the wheel in Ezekiel's vision is this same word, wheel, 212. Um, it's a chariot wheel. Isn't that um, interesting? Basis, right. Okay. So, so we need discretion in order to understand how to apply these lines. How to draw light from them. Red corn is bruised because he will not ever be threshing it nor break it with the wheel of his cart nor bruise it with his horsemen. Now, you know, so these are a little bit obscure because we, we don't really do these things nowadays. Um, uh, just, well, they would trot over their crops to release the stuff, you know, the, the fruit, the, the stuff that they wanted. And then they would um, uh, use... Uh, the natural wind cycle, you know, to separate it. I mean, you've, I've seen the, I've seen the operations done where they first, they, um, 
kind of flail it a little bit and then they then they take it in baskets and they throw it up in the air in during a breeze you know so the uh, the the chafe will be pulled out but they also use animals and stuff to do the same stuff to trot on it you know to release this stuff because right. it needs a bit of pressure with and you, you want to save time and so and energy so you allow your animals to do it yeah so um, in 2828, so this is the English standard version. Does one crush grain for bread? No, he does not thresh it forever. When he drives his cartwheel over it with his horses, he does not crush it. Right? So different grains need to be treated differently. And we, need this, we need this discretion. We need to be rightly instructed by God in order to understand the lines. And now the problem is, is we can draw conclusions from the lines if we just use human reasoning. So we've been really, really careful when we study, right? Everything that we have done in how we have studied and approached things is first to be corrected by God, to be instructed by God to be open to what he wants to teach us. And we've, we've examined the foundation because that foundation has been laid in order to understand how to approach the present, right? Correct. So we just haven't gone on ahead and just said, okay, we're just gonna figure this out from here. We went back to the past, examined the foundation. We learned a great deal in examining the foundation. That is, we understood how we were paralleling Millerite history in our understanding of things. The mistakes that they made, how we were making the same mistakes. And then we corrected ourselves based upon that. But not everyone in the movement is doing that. Not everyone is studying to be corrected, to be guided by God. That is, we think we're harvesting truth, but we're actually doing damage. We think we're drawing out lines, but those lines aren't according to the model that has been given in this movement. That is, we see lines that don't have a first angel arriving. They don't have a period of darkness. They don't have a formalization of the message with the laying of a foundation, a second angel or a, a, a first angel being formalized with uh, work of the enemies or a second angel arriving and it being formalized and empowered and a third angel arriving and a fourth angel arriving. Right. So we, we see lines and they have dates and they have structure. But we can't we can't glean from that what they mean. Right? Because God has given us how to glean, how to apply line upon line. And that comes from Millerite history. So this also cometh from the Lord of hosts, which is wonderful in counsel, counsel, counsel. And that wonderful is what? It's things that are hidden, that are secret. Almoni. Right. Now, this is uh, Pala, which is uh, the root of the word Palmoni. And he's wonderful in counsel and excellent in working. And this yeah, that working here. word got to me again um, with that quote about the August 11th, 1840 thing. Yes. Wonder, wonderful manifestation or wonderful, um, what did you call it? Wonderful an manifestation impetus. of the power of God. Well, there's a, an, an a impetus. Power, a wonderful impetus is, is what place is what she said. Yeah. Okay. So, so we're going to just try to draw this on a line and see that we're, our time is kind of up. Uh, but I'm going to go there anyway and finish this off.
Okay, so we have a formalization of the message. Now we're going to say here, this could be, and I don't know the answer to this particularly, but I'm putting it as December 6th, 2020. And then we're going to have the foundation laid. And then it's going to be empowered. So this is going to be empowered where? Because we're going to examine the foundation. We could even say that that's just the study of, of studying the foundation. Would that be the first? You want to put the first study date? Is that what you're looking at? Well, yeah. So we could put, you know, March 7th, 2021 here. But then we have a second angel's message arrives. And that's going to be the message of line upon line. So that's going to be December uh, 26th, 2021. We could say it's December 25th if we want to, because there are some messages that arrive there. And this message is formalized where? Uh, it's January. Can't remember the date, but uh, uh, it was it was the one the presentation at Collins, where it didn't materialize after it happened. Isn't that what we thought? Well, it depends. So, so this line is dealing with the drunkards of Ephraim, right? Right. So we have this first message. It's going to be testing this movement, and we we get to December twenty fifth. And, and we're going to start um, a new study, right? That's going to be addressing this um, understanding the lines. So I don't know exactly what we're going to put here because we didn't. Could we use um, could we use uh, the four nine days later? Okay. A formalization of that would be February um, was it the 12th. I can't remember. 2022. That's going to be Odilia. Yeah, that's what I thought. I mean, Odilia. You have to say what, what empowers this. So we have these messages here. Do we have an empowerment? Would we put this as December 25th, 2020? Two. The invitation date. Yeah. And then we have to have a third angel arrive. And we would put this January 11th, 2023. And so when we look at this, this is an understanding of light coming to this movement. Right, and this becomes a symbol of a close of probation. Whether this is the best line to do, uh, we, we probably needed more time to draw out this line. But what we should be able to see from these passages is that we do have a line in this chapter of line upon line. Right, it's not just telling us about line on line, it's illustrating line upon line. And this is this is based on that Isaiah, wasn't it? Twenty eight. Isaiah twenty eight. Which makes sense. Yeah. So that's it's that line. That's what we just did. Actually, was we just did the line of Isaiah twenty eight. Yeah. Whether that you know whether if we spent more time at it because we did this kind of rush. We yeah, probably... we're getting pretty good at doing this, you know. Mm hmm. But there may be more here in these symbols that that could give us more, more specific dates. I, I think you're correct in that. I mean, because I'm I don't know why I keep coming up with that, you know, or why I even said. I mean, I do know why because it came upon me, and um, then I I just had to ask the question. Yeah. Well, um, you you had made a comment, an email. You sent me an email about John chapter eight, verse one to eleven. Right. So this is the story of the woman uh, caught in the act of adultery. 
right? Right. And, you know, you asked the question about 811, because that's where Jesus is going to say, um, uh, neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more, right? Now, of course, right. that's a symbol for August 11th, 1840, but it's also a symbol for uh, November 9th, because it's the 11th day of the eighth month on the biblical calendar. Right. So it, it symbolizes 9-11. Because 9-11 also is the empowerment of the first angel, which parallels August 11th, 1840. But the idea here is that there's this woman caught in the act of adultery. But she's forgiven. And this can refer to us in this movement. Right. Because right. if we look at how we have studied, we have not studied according to god's direct counsel but also you see a group of people who want to condemn her but they're not without sin it was pointed out to them uh we have knowledge spirit of prophecy has told us what the, what he was doing when he was right there he was, he was drawing line upon line in the sand right Right? Isn't that what he's doing? Well, um, from symbolically, it, symbolically, that's what he's doing. But yeah. he he was he was you know just writing their sins on the sand. Isn't that what Sister White said? And that's what a line does, doesn't it? That yes, it convicts convicts of sin. Yeah, it's a line of judgment. Right. Okay. So. It's a three. It's a three-step testing prophetic message that uh, develops and demonstrates two classes of worshipers. So, so I think you're right in saying that we can take uh, chapter eight, symbol of the resurrection, from one to eleven. Though the focus is on eight eleven, um, as referring to a message to this movement, it's a line. Okay. So I hope this was helpful, you know, for those watching it. Obviously, um, we do have our morning study still. We're going to do line up on a line. But for Sundays for now, I'm going to be taking this off. One is because I'm going to be doing gardening. And uh, so I need the time during the day um, uh, on Sundays. So any final thoughts before we close with prayer? Okay, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study this afternoon. And I just pray for a blessing upon all those searching your word. May you lead and guide them. We know, Lord, there's much that we need to learn and that... Um, there's many things that we continue to see in your word that, that puzzle us and that, we, that show us our lack of understanding. So we ask that you can give us your wisdom and discretion, that we can follow your methods, that we can see our sins, and that we can confess them and forsake them, and that we can be a revelation of your character to those around us. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.